Okay, this is another drawing that I have done in my series, Copying the Masters. And this is a, another Gibson girl. The first Gibson girl that I did, she didn't have a whole lot of shading in the face. It was mostly just uh, practicing her hair. There was a little bit of shading, a little bit of shadow in the eye socket. With this, uh, she's got more shading a little on her forehead, on her cheek, under her nose, under her chin and on her neck and so it was another step forward in rendering form uh, now women are particularly difficult in that it's easy to get real heavy-handed when you're using pen and ink and just to uh, make really dense heavy shadows and so copying these Gibson girls is a great exercise because it it teaches you to be very subtle and very soft in your approach. Another thing thing that it does is that it's really helping to teach you the language of pen and ink. You know, every medium that you use has its own unique qualities. And in something like pen and ink, especially when you're doing this type of a technique, it is, it's very unique that you're, you're not going to do any painting technique quite like this. So you've got to use a visual language that you're just not used to. We don't think in terms uh, of a lot of small hatch marks to define form. So there's a lot of different approaches. You can do different forms of cross hatching. You can do sort of a scribbly technique, which that's actually what I'm more comfortable with, uh, a controlled sort of scribble technique. I really like it, but I wanted to, the reason I'm doing this is to expose myself to a more controlled hand and eventually integrating sort of my style, which is leans more toward Heinrich Clay. If you look him up, he was a German uh, pen and ink artist during the golden age of illustration and just had a remarkable, remarkable work. Uh, Gibson, much more controlled, much more refined. And I sort of want to just absorb some of his technique, which is a little more controlled. Now, I'm not a big fan of cross hatching in that I don't want to do it everywhere. Obviously, if you look at Gibson's work, he does quite a bit of cross hatching, but it's it's very controlled. He doesn't rely on that to be the main source of describing form. Mostly he's using uh linear strokes. <clears throat> and it varies. It goes from but from going with the form to going against the form. So, for instance, in the cheek, the jowl, and the chin, the strokes are ap actually wrapping around the face and describing the form that way. Whereas on the neck, it's actually going across the form, describing the volume of the neck as it turns in space. You could have done that on the, or I could have done that on the side of the face and the chin, but it would be more, I think, really more like a feathery technique that is used by comic book artists where they will go from a heavy lined uh, a heavy line and sort of pull a soft feathered stroke off of it. If you heard a pop, that was, it's getting warm in my studio and the uh, mineral spirits can just pop. So that's what sort of startled me and got me off track for a second. But um, yeah, so that's what I'm doing here is kind of going back and forth between strokes that describe the form as it turns in space and strokes that go along with the form. And some of that you just have to get used to it. You have to learn, well, this this technique is a little bit better 
in this situation than uh, than the others. I'm, there really wouldn't be a right or wrong. It would just be what effect are you trying to achieve? And that's where, you know, I'm asked by students, you know, what's the be- what's the right technique or wrong technique? And there's not really a right or wrong. There's the best for what you're trying to achieve. So um, just keep that in mind that uh, you can you can approach your your work with a number of techniques, a number of mediums. You just need to decide, okay, what am I trying to achieve, and then that's going to inform how you approach your your subject. Now, of course, with doing uh, the female head, the female figure is softer. It's uh, smoother than the male figure, the male face. And again, that's where you want to work with not being real heavy handed because you'll begin to age the woman and make a woman who's in her 20s look like she's in her 50s, 60s, 80s really, really quickly. So it's a good discipline, a good practice if you're going to to do something like copying uh, figures is to do a number of different kinds. Do men, do old men, young men, do old women, young women, children, clothed figures, nude figures, do them uh, in real heavy contrast lighting, do them in very flat lighting, do them with three-quarter lighting, just uh, any kind of variation that you can think of that will expose you to different lighting situations and make it where nothing surprises you. You know, if you copy a bunch of Gibsons and you've done uh, drawings where he's he's got his figures in bright sunlight so that there are heavy raking shadows, well, then you see how you can apply those raking shadows to a very soft, delicate female figure and not make her look old or um, heavy and overworked. But then you can also see where a flatter lighting situation is appropriate, but yet your figure still has substance. It doesn't look so ethereal that it just doesn't have any substance and it's almost floating on the paper and it just doesn't have any weight to it. No contrast. Now doing the hair, um, a lot of it is is following the form of the hair. So what direction is the hair going? That's the direction you want your strokes to be. If you do any cross hatching, you do it just to further add a little bit of solidity and a little bit of weight to the shadows, but I really don't know that I'd want to ever do hair cross hatching. It would become very mechanical and very stiff. Now a little bit later you'll see where on the perimeter of the hair I put some wispy strokes and that's just because you don't want the uh, in the portrait painting world, we would call it, call it helmet hair, where it just looks like the hair is some sort of a helmet or hat that's just been uh, placed on top of the person's head, as opposed to something that's flowing from their head. That's a, uh, there's, that there's that soft transition, one, between the forehead and uh, the, the hair, but then also between the hair and the background. So you want... You know, a few wisps that just um, give a softer transition from the hair itself into the background. And I always try to work dark to light. And by that, I mean I don't go in and try and do uh, a slow buildup of values. I'm not saying you can't. Some people do, and I guess that's fine. But for me, what I find more effective is to go in and really establish 
the darks. You've got the white of the paper already sitting there, so there are your highlights. If you put in your shadows, and you think of them in terms of shadow shapes, then you can go back and integrate the two together so you could have softer transitions between the shadows and and the darks, or excuse me. So then you can have uh, an easier, softer transition between the shadows and the highlights. Now, the materials I'm using, I'm using Strathmore Bristol Smooth Paper. It's Series 300, 100 pound paper. It's thick, it's heavy, it can take a lot of abuse, and when you use a nib, it can be pretty abusive. I mean, they're needle sharp, and so especially if you do any sort of a scribbly technique where you're actually pushing the nib forward, you can wind up just gouging the paper, which is fine. You just want a paper that can take that kind of abuse. Um, I'm using Sumi ink I have used Higgins uh, Black Magic, which is, is fine. It's just as real watery compared to Sumi ink. And I think I like the body of the Sumi ink a little bit better. Uh, again, either one's fine. I would strongly encourage you to buy both. It's just, uh, and then, then you can learn which one you like the best and which one may be better for certain, certain techniques. But uh, certainly... Uh, it's the Sumi ink is is far thicker and more heavily pigmented. It takes longer to dry, but um, you'll just have to make that choice. The nib I'm using is a Tachikawa, a Tachikawa calligraphy nib. The ta the nib I'm using is a Tachikawa calligraphy nib. Uh, they're, they're not as flexible as some croquels, far more than some other croquels. So, I mean, I guess it's a happy medium. But um, I like it. Uh, I use zebra nibs, zebra Gs sometimes. Um, so far, I like the Tachikawas better. I like their, their flex. Uh, seems to be a little bit better. But, again, that's going to be personal taste. You just got to sort of play and see if that's what you prefer. I'm using the cheapest pen holder you can get, those like dollar and a half plastic ones. I like they've got that sort of, well, for lack of a better, ter better term, that female hourglass form as opposed to some of the straighter pen handles it just the curve of it seems to be more ergonomic but again i'd buy that i'd buy a couple of others play and see which one you like and uh go with that but i certainly like the ergonomic feel of that uh, cheap inexpensive speedball pen holder i get my nibs from John Neal books. You can look them up online. John Neal books. They're really nice, really knowledgeable. They're they're a small mom and pop organization, and they'll they'll help you out. They can if you tell them what you're trying to do, they can sort of steer you in the right direction. And then lastly, you know, I watch these things. I I, I do them, and then I come back later and watch them, so I don't always remember what I did. But if you see me doing any corrections, I'm using a Montana acrylic marker. It, uh, I get the ones that are empty and refill them with uh, golden fluid acrylic paint. And it's relatively cheap to do. And I've never had a problem painting over or inking over acrylic paint. So if you, as long as you know, keep it sort of smooth. Don't just pile it on impasto style. But if you put down uh, ink, make a mistake, just go over it with the acrylic paint and then you can ink right over it.
If you've enjoyed this episode of The Arthropologist, please hit the like button. And if you'd like to see more episodes like this, think about subscribing. I'm Bill Wilson, and I'm The Arthropologist.